Again, it's Christian author and teacher evangelist Joe Callahan coming to you with uh, some more teachings <coughs> that I hope to share with you. <coughs> Excuse me, throat's a little clogged. Anyway, there's something I would like to explain to you. Um, several things, as a matter of fact, is uh, you may notice at the end of our program we put a notation about uh, if anyone would like to donate to this ministry, you know, where to donate. We also make a note that it's not tax-free. Now there's a reason for that, and the reason is that I don't have any man's ordination. I've been offered five different ministers offered to ordain me under their ministry, and the Holy Spirit had me turn it down. He said he wants people to understand that I have his anointing on my life to teach, and that's who I have the uh, ordination from, and not from any man. It was hard to do that, and as a matter of fact, if I hadn't have done that, if I'd have accepted one of them, then we could be tax exempt. But the government won't accept the fact that the Holy Spirit can ordain someone to do work. Spiritually speaking, that's correct. The Holy Spirit can ordain someone. I'm one of those people that he's chosen to do that. There's others, not just me, but there's others. But that's why we put down the anything donated is not tax exempt. And then also I would ask you to please, before deciding to send a dime in, please send the, watch the teaching that I put out on how we are to give. Because I don't want people that are having money that's really tight getting by with sending me a dime, that's, that's not the point. I'm out to reach and bring souls into the kingdom of God and people to receive Jesus as their savior. It's not about money, although this does cost. Now, what would I do with the money if it did come in? Well, I have plans. And basically, the Lord has given me so many beautiful and powerful psalms through the years, you know, I came out with a book in 2008 called 21st Century Psalms. It had 200, 117 psalms in it. Since that time, though, I've written well over 100 psalms. It's been since quite a while. It's been over a decade since 2008. But every so often, the Holy Spirit will wake me up in the middle of the night and give me beautiful and powerful psalms. Well, my idea and my goal is to put these psalms out in ebook editions having just a small number of psalms not a huge what I found was that um, it makes it more affordable ebook you don't have to pay for pages and for shipping uh, and then ebook if people I know I used to buy records and they'd have 12 songs on it by the artist I bought it because I liked one song that was on it. Some of the other songs were just dogs, but I had to pay the money for them anyway. Well, I'm not saying that about these psalms. They're all powerful and beautiful psalms, but there's some people that might like a certain type of psalms in particular, and it's contained in this particular volume of 21st Century Psalms. I plan on putting out edition 1, volumes 1 through 7, 2, volumes 1 through 7, 3, Volumes 1 through 7. At the present time, we do have out, and in time for Christmas, by the way, which makes a great gift to a uh, stocking stuffer for your Christian friends, but I have 21st Century Psalms Edition 1, Volume 1. A little bit later, I'll read an excerpt of one of the psalms from that. In one of my other teachings, I read the one, uh, Plea to Save Christmas. There are five psalms in this about uh, Christmas and then the rest are uh, of spiritual material other than Christmas. They make a great stocking stuffer, super reasonable because of the price of it. It's, it's uh, an e-book, it's not real large, but you would love the Psalms, in it, I'm, I'm sure. And they're, they're just so beautiful and so powerful and so timely. But, uh, let me go on and continue uh, explaining. Um, this past week I've had to <clears throat> me and 
<clears throat> warfare with Satan. I've had um, times when my nose was bleeding um, day and night, 24-7, for three days straight. And I would have um, sharp, stabbing pain in my heart. And uh, then I had dealings with, um, what do they call that? Um, heartburn in my stomach and in my throat that made me nauseous. I'd get up in the middle of the night and, and be sick. Uh, the, the week has been like that, and I've been taking Satan on. He, he's trying to scare me and say, I'm taking you out, and I said, no, I'm telling you, you're going right now into hell where you belong. You don't belong in my life. And I use the authority that I have and just kick him out, and there's no way he's going to frighten me. My life is in God's hands, not his. And how and when and why I, I die, that's up to God. He has work for me to do. He has use for my life. And I keep praying and asking him, please don't let me die. I haven't been nothing but a failure to you. Use me mightily the way you did St. Paul. Make of me an example of someone that can turn their life to you and turn it around and be used by you to reach others. That's my daily prayer. And so I stand on that. I stand on the fact that my Father's love for me is perfect. So Satan in no way whatsoever can bring any fear on me regardless of what silly tactics he tries to use. But as a result of this, I haven't had the time to study and prepare for the teaching the way that I usually do. And because of that, uh, I was asking the Lord, what, what should I do? Well, I think I mentioned in my first uh, program about how I'd been blessed back in the year 2008 that I was given the opportunity by the pastor there to speak on the first Sunday evening of each month. And I did that for approximately two years. Uh, Solid Rock Church was a church where they helped people get off of drugs and alcohol. Uh, they would have as many as 250 people at a time, sometimes just 200 or 150. It varied. And of course they had their community members as well. But they didn't pay him anything, but what they did do was they made DVDs of the teaching that you gave, and they gave me a copy of that. So what I've done for this upcoming teaching, which will air on the 27th of November, uh, and then for the other one, which will be December 4th, I've gotten into the files and looked up and found those two teachings. and. Um, I think I better explain something about some of them. Um, the teaching that we plan on airing on the uh, on the 27th is one that's uh, called uh, "Discerning the True Light of Salvation." Now, this is a DVD, so it's in video, and it was, believe it or not, it was 10 years ago. I looked at it, and on the envelope that it comes in, it was November 1st, 2009, that I gave this teaching at, at Solid Rock. But it's a, it's a very interesting teaching about a dream that I had. And you may notice in the, uh, <laughs> in the picture that uh, because a lot of our clientele were people getting off of drugs and alcohol, uh, they tended to be camera shy, and it looks like there's hardly anybody there to even listen. But we had side rows on both the left and right side. So when you it's film shooting straight down on the middle side, they found out if I stay on the side, they won't get me in the picture. Some of them were just camera shy for one reason or another. But the sides, we had at least 50 people on each side. So there was, you know, well over 100 people that were there, even though it looks like there's only a few. But I think you'll enjoy this teaching. Uh, this is the teaching which, by the way, I was watching it, and near the end, this has the young lady that jumped when I said, wake up! <laughs> I remember I told you about that and it was, uh, I just couldn't believe it, it was so funny. But um, anyway, that's this teaching will air on the 27th. Be sure and try to catch it, it's, it's really rich. Now the other teaching that will air on December 4th, I'm so glad we're heading into Christmas because I've got some really powerful teachings coming up. This one is called, Which Kingdom Will You Choose to Dwell In? Now, on this, in finding my DVD copy, I went to play it and 
something has happened through the years and it said it wouldn't play on this machine. So instead of giving uh, my gentleman uh, friend Charles who's helping me with this a, a giant headache trying to get it to work, I found that I also had a CD copy of it. This teaching is, is very powerful too and um, you can, it's like listening to radio. Go back to the good old days when we didn't have television. But when you hear this teaching, you'll be blessed because it has to, there's every day we have a decision to make of which kingdom we're going to dwell in. And there's something I should explain about this since it doesn't have the vision, is I had the church take down the uh, balsa, balsa wood cross that they had. It was about seven feet long and I had him put it on the floor. And then in my teaching, I'm explaining this so that you can picture it in your mind, but in my teaching as I was walking along, I said, what's this? And then I bent down to pick it up. Now, <laughs> I wasn't expecting a balsa wood cross to be heavy, but you'll hear me grunting. <laughs> it was a bit heavier than I thought, but I had to pick it up because that's what we're supposed to do is daily take up our cross. It was making a point. And then also you'll find, uh, later you'll hear me say thank you, you know. And that's because I commandeered one of the people that were there that evening to, uh, when I took up that cross, to stand before me. And he was representing the guy who had done a bad deed to me. And how that now that I was carrying the cross, how I was going to have to choose to deal with him. He was standing right in front of me. So I thought I'd better explain those two uh, things to you so that you'll understand when we come to that section of this particular teaching. And again, I'm sorry the uh, DVD just, something's happened through the years and it, it just wasn't going to work. And so that explains that. The well, last thing I wanted to tell you is, please try not to miss the teachings in December. If you don't believe that the Holy Spirit has ordained me to teach from God's Word, check in the teachings that we have for you in December. You already know about December 4th, uh, which kingdom will you choose to dwell in? On December 11th, we're going to have, fill me with the fire of your love. On December 18th, we're going to have a teaching on earning a mansion in heaven. And on December 25th, as a Christmas present, I'm airing one of my favorite and I believe one of the most powerful teachings that I've been given. And it's called The Importance of Gaining Spiritual Maturity. Uh, you don't necessarily have to watch it on the 25th. That's the first date that it airs. And of course, we keep all the teachings available so you can watch it at your leisure anytime. But it's a very powerful teaching. I think all these teachings fill me with the fire of your love and earning a mansion in heaven and especially the importance of gaining spiritual maturity. They're so powerful that you really will be blessed by tuning in those teachings. And please do me a favor and tell others about it too. You know, we're to share the gospel with other people, whether we share it on our own or whether we hear a good sermon and we can pass the word along to someone else, tune in Joe's teaching on messages to the bride. I'm telling you, it's an honor for me to be used by God in this way. And I'm so thrilled and excited that before I die, that I'll be able to reach people and help them have a better understanding of what it is to be a Christian. In January, we're going to talk about being a believer and then we're going to talk about the ingredients necessary to do the works of a believer. So don't miss January's teaching. It's going to be an exciting start to a brand new year. I plan on being around for it. hope you will too. Right now, God bless and thanks for tuning in. Hey, it's an honor and a privilege to be here again tonight. Thank you, Pastor. It really is an honor. And uh, I think one of the things... I'm wanted to do tonight to start off is take you back a little bit in time. Uh, some of you may not have been here when I spoke about my dealings with the San Blas Indians. 
uh, when I was down in Panama, went to Suscaputo in the Suscatora Island chain and traded with the Indians. And I wound up trading a radio for a Mola outfit. And at the time that I spoke, I didn't have that outfit with me. I was trying to find it, couldn't find where it was at. Well, guess what? I found it. Just wanted to show you all what it looked like. And I got to get Dodie to wearing this thing one day. She said she'd do it, you know. <laughs> but I got to get her to fix this up. This is the skirt. Is that, is that far out or what? And it's quilt like material. It's really neat. And then, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. I'm getting a frog in my throat. <coughs> okay. The top. Now, on the top, you'll notice something very unique. Does anybody see signs of World War II in this top? Yeah. Not, Nazi swastikas. There's a neat story about that. Now, well, where we, where we were at was about seven degrees from the equator between the Panama and Colombian border. But do you see all these not Nazi swastikas in here? During World War II, the good old Nazis came down to San Blas Indian territory. And they tried to convert the San Blas Indians into being good Nazis. Now, the Indians weren't stupid. And they said, tell you what, Nazis, you're nutsy. But we do like, we do like your swastika idea. We're going to put that in our embroidering. So that's how, even in 1969, way after World War II, this is what I got. It has all these swastika designs. It was in several of their outfits. So they liked the designs, but they thought the Nazis were stupid. Stupid people. Good decision. Now, as you all know, I'm notorious for starting off with uh, a little bit of humor. Like Pastor said, are you here to have fun tonight? Okay, well we're going to have some fun, just a little bit. I'm going to get into a real serious subject tonight, and it's not funny at all. It's very serious. But I will start out by telling you this. Um, the times have really changed. And I hadn't realized that so much until one day, years ago, I was working at Kmart, and I was covering the camera department for the guy who was at lunch, and I hear all this noise going on, boxes being opened in the aisle just behind me. That was the toy department. So I went over to investigate. When I got there, here's this little boy, he's about five years old. His mother turned to little Brat Luth and said, have fun. He was ripping into the packages, and he ripped into this package that had a toy gun. And it was a toy pistol like a cowboy pistol. You know, you've seen those, the good old Colt Peacemaker, Colt 45. So the little guy had that out and was playing with it. And I came up, and he looked a little shocked. <laughs> so I said, uh, hey, partner, could I see your gun? And he handed it to me, and it, fortunately it was wide enough a trigger guard that I could stick my big fat finger in there and still twirl the gun. Now, being from Kentucky, like my grandmother said, Kentuckians cut their teeth on a gun. I had a neighbor who not only taught me how to be an expert marksman with a rifle, but he also taught me how to twirl pistols. I could twirl them forward, backward, twirl them like that and pop them into the holster, you know, fast draw and all that. I learned all that stuff, you know, from my next door neighbor. And so anyway, I take this pistol when he handed it to me and I twirled it forward and then stopped it and had it in my hand. And then I twirled it backwards and stopped it and had it in my hand. And the little guy's eyes are real big, you know. And so then I did what's called the highwayman's reverse. I don't know if any of you know what that is or have heard of it before, but it's where you go. You'll see it in the movies sometime where the, you go to act like you're handing over the gun to the guy. And you have it butt first facing him. Only the trigger, you've got your finger inside the trigger guard. And where your uh, fingernail is, you have it on the side of the gun. And as you reach over to hand it to him, when he reaches for it, you give a quick flick of your finger and a quick flick of your wrist, and you've got the gun in your hand, and you've got the hammer cocked back, and you've got it aimed and pointing at him. So that's what I did to this little guy. He reached for the gun, and when he did, I went like that and had it in my hand and pointed at him. Now, Cowboy Bill back here and I, we would have looked at the guy and said, wow, that's neat. Are you a cowboy? Of course, that's in our day. This little guy looks at me, and he goes, wow, that's neat. Are you an ex-con? 
I go, whoa, <laughs> the times have changed, you know? <laughs> so what did I do? I looked at him and I said, yeah, I am, kid. I escaped and don't tell anybody. And he said, no, sir, I won't. And his eyes got real big. <laughs> so I had some fun with the poor little guy. And I said, another thing, don't open up any more packages. <laughs> no, sir, I won't. <laughs> so anyway, that worked. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm very excited about is uh, toward the middle or maybe end of this month, we're going to come out with one of my other books in print. And it's my book that I've been telling you about. It's called Adventures in Navy Land. Big book, 179 pages, 32 chapters in it. It's exciting. It's a fun book. And I shared some of the stories with you about pouring a drunk into his bunk, you know, things like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, tonight I'd like to share with you something a little more serious. It's a more serious nature, but it also, the reason I'm sharing it with you is because it also has to do with the teaching that I want to share with you tonight. So tonight, to start off, I'd like to tell you about the adventure of guarding Wild Willie. I worked... Uh, in what's called an ops operation control center, it's short OPCON, and uh, it was interesting work. You had to have a secret clearance to work there, and I did part-time courier work. But uh, one day, they had a, a special job for us. Uh, they asked for volunteers, and I'm one of the ones that they volunteered. <laughs> uh, they volunteered three of us for special guard duty, and it turns out that uh, they had in the hospital this gigantic guy who had uh, head injuries. And he was at Gorgas Hospital. It was a beautiful modern-day hospital that's right on the border of Balboa and Panama City. And his was an interesting story. We were to <laughs> given strict orders to go into his room. We were given issued billy clubs, wooden billy clubs. And we were to go into his room when the people had to take him medicine or had to take food to him. We were not to stay and talk with him, but just see to it that those people got in safely and got out safely and that he didn't try to escape. It turned out that this young man, I think he was about 22 at the time, he was an Ohio farm boy and uh, didn't know a whole lot about life. And what had happened is his ship was visiting in Venezuela and was in port for about a month. And in the course of that time, he wound up being introduced to a prostitute. This particular prostitute wanted a free ticket to the United States. So she convinced him he was in love with her. And he wanted to marry her. He tells the captain of the ship, I found the girl of my dreams, and I want to get married. Now, as was customary, the captain of the ship went to the American embassy. How about this girl? Let's call her Conchita, you know? Well, the American embassy said, she's a well-known prostitute, and she's looking for a ticket to get into the United States. So the captain said, I absolutely refuse to grant you permission to get married. This girl is a prostitute. Now, the boy had been convinced that he was in love. He had never had any intimate relations with a woman. This was the first time in his life. And to him, the way I feel, it must be love, you know? And the captain said, I don't care what you feel. The facts are she's going to try to use you for a ticket to get in the United States since she'll leave you high and dry, and it's not going to happen. Well, it turns out that when his ship left Venezuela, it left without him. He stayed behind. He wanted to be with his love of his life. Well, the Navy doesn't take too kindly to that. And this guy was large. He was big. And they sent six shore patrol officers to arrest him. They got cuffs on him and got him arrested, and four of them wound up in the hospital, just getting the job done. So they put him on a plane bound for the good old U.S. of A, back to his ship 
that was headed toward Norfolk so he could stand cap the captain's mast for what he'd done. Jumping ship is a crime. And on the way back to the United States, he had six shore patrol guys guarding him, and he was in cuffs. And his cuffs were behind his back, not in front of him. And these shore patrol guys were angry with him for putting four of their brothers in the hospital. So on the plane ride back to the States, they started mocking him. They knew his story, and they started telling him what a fool he was messing around with a prostitute. Started calling her all kinds of names because they knew it would get to him. And they just were making all manner of fun of him, and especially fun of his love of his life, to where he just got to where he couldn't take it anymore, so he attacked them on the plane, but with his hands cuffed behind his back. And he was no match for six shore patrol with lead-lined billy clubs. They beat him over the head so violently and so many times that the plane had to make an emergency landing in Panama so that he could be taken to Gorgas Hospital for emergency treatment. Now when he came, he was uh, in a coma, uh, not a coma, he had a concussion. Uh, and so they picked three people to spend eight hour shifts guarding him. He was in one of these rooms that had a heavy metal door and it had real thick glass with that mesh in between where you could look in and see people. The top panel was that and the bottom panel was all metal. And so we each had eight hour shifts to guard him. And like I say, strict orders not to talk to him, just stay outside the room and only go in when the people needed to go in. And so the first day, he was with us for an entire week, seven day week. And the first day he was pretty much out of it. His head was all bandaged, uh, bandaged just around his face. And uh, he'd just get the medicine and that's it. They'd wake him to eat and he could barely eat. They'd have to feed him. And the second day he starts getting a little better by the third day, he was sitting up in bed. Well, when I'd take the people in to give him his medicine or his food, I would say hello to him, talk a little bit with him, and then leave. Well, by the third day, I got in and started spending some time talking with him. And that's how I found out his story. And we started the building, building a rapport. And... Uh, I tried to offer him some counseling, and you had to be ever so careful about how you worded things because if he, he was real touchy about her, but you had to tell him there's other fish in the sea. This is not the only woman. And I tried to get it across to him that love is more than a feeling. It's more than a physical feeling. It's a lot more, especially if it's going to last. It better be more. So we had a good rapport going. He asked me if I could bring him some magazines. He said he's been locked up for so long, he doesn't know what's happening in the world. I brought him copies of Look and Life magazine. And I would just come in and talk with him for like four, five, sometimes six hours. Now, I could have been in trouble probably if they'd have caught me doing that. But I was building a rapport with him and trying to get some understanding. And I was trying to help him basically so that, you know, he was going to have to face Captain's math, and I wanted him to have a better understanding of why what had happened, and maybe he'd get a more lenient treatment if he understood and confessed and said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Well, <coughs> he told me, like on the fourth day, he said, you're the only one that's not afraid of me. He said, the other two guys, they stand outside and look in the window at me like I'm an animal in a zoo. And he said, sometimes, just for the fun of it, I make a run at the door and I growl at him like that. And he said, you should see the fear in their eyes. Their face their lights up with fear. And he said, you're the only one that's willing to come in here and talk to me like I'm a fellow human being. And I said, well, since you're from Ohio and I'm from Kentucky and I went to school in Ohio, I said, we're kind of like neighbors and I think maybe I understand you a little better than they do. I know where you're coming from. <clears throat> And in a polite, nice way, I tried to tell him it's because you're naive. You don't understand, you know, what things in life are really about. Well, we worked on that. Anyway, things were going along really good. But on the sixth day, he was really a lot better. And on the sixth day that he was with us, I was in talking with him one uh, that day. And uh, 
Usually, I would sit down in the visitor's chair, and he would sit on the bed. But on the sixth day, he gets up and starts pacing back and forth across the room. And he started getting me a little concerned. So I went over and stood in front of the door. I thought, is he trying to warn me of something? So he looks at me, and he says, you know, Joe, I'm getting a little tired of being cooped up and confined in here. I think I may just decide to leave. I said, not on my watch, you're not. He said, would you try to stop me if I went out that door? He said, what would you do if right now I just walked toward the front, to, toward the door? And I said, well, you stupid idiot, I'd break this stupid billy club over your ignorant head. He said, would you really do that? I said, he said, would you really want to do that? And I said, not so much want to do it, but have to do it. It's my job. It's my responsibility to see that you do not leave here. And I'll do anything that I need to do to see that that doesn't happen. You're not going to leave here. Not on my watch, buddy. He goes, but I thought you were my friend. I said, I am. I thought you were my friend. I said, you don't need another headache. And I don't need the aggravation of you trying to get through me because it's just not going to happen. He looked at me and he said, uh, put a big grin on his face. And he walked back over to the uh, bed and sat down on it. And he looked at me and he said, you know what, Joe? I believe you. I believe you really would break that billy club over my head. I think I'll keep you for my friend. Neat story, isn't it? Now, the reason I shared this with you is it's an example of something. This young man got into trouble because he lacked discernment. He lacked discernment about what a prostitute is. He, I think it's probably a word he'd never run across in his life on the farm. He had no concept of what real love was. To him, it was a physical feeling. He lacked discernment because he lacked knowledge. And what I'd like to speak to you about tonight, and it's really important because of the times that we're in, it's about a teaching contained in an upcoming book that we plan on putting out next year. It's called A Season of Apathy. Many of the problems that we're having in our country today are directly due to the long season of apathy by those calling themselves Christian. Because of apathy, millions of babies are murdered in their mother's womb every year for the sake of convenience. Christian apathy has allowed prayer to be removed from our schools while condoms are freely given out and alternate lifestyles are being taught to be acceptable moral behavior. Where are the Christians? Why aren't they speaking up against this? Apathy. For the most part, we stood by in silence and watched as the Ten Commandments were removed first from our courts and then from most federal buildings. Where are the Christian voices? Apathy. Apathy has a, oh, what do you call it, a side effect, just like Medicine sometimes has dangerous side effects. There's dangerous side effects to apathy, and it's called pathetic. Pathetic gets its name from apathy. When you sit by in apathy, pathetic things are allowed to happen. For example, <coughs> apathy permits no mention of Christmas by employees in stores where we spend our money buying Christmas presents. Our apathy allows them to threaten those employees with being fired if they so much as say, Merry Christmas. And yet we spend our money there. Where's our voice? And talk about apathy having side effects. No longer are children in grade school taught to sing God Bless America 
or the joy of singing any Christmas carol. But, mm, 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 our grade school children are taught to sing a song of praise to the president. Is that pathetic or what? We can't sing to the one true God, but we can give praise to the one that's trying to take our country down. I'm sorry, that's what's happening. Now, I'm not speaking about the apathy of religious Christians. Apathy among religious Christians is just part of the powerlessness of religion. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, and the power is the Spirit of God, the will of God at work in our life directing us. Religious Christians don't have the Holy Spirit because they deny him the opportunity to, de to teach the truth to their followers. They fill their followers with man-made doctrines and dogmas of pride and division. They don't teach them about the relationship God wants to share with them. They teach them about their man-made religious doctrines. Now, I'm seeking tonight to address the true body and bride of Christ. Those claiming to have relationship with God and not religion, with the one true God. The apathy of the religious Christians seems to have lulled the true body in Christ to follow after apathy also. Where will this apathy lead? I've received the answer to that, and I'd like to share it with you tonight. In the second chapter of Acts, in verses, you don't have to really go there. It's just two verses I'm going to do, but if you wish, go right ahead. In the second chapter of Acts, verses 17 and 18, I'll just wait. <coughs> While you're turning, I'm going to grab some water. Maybe I can drown this frog. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I never thought of that before. Okay, so hopefully everybody's there by now, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, although I'm young at heart, and I'm really only 35 since I got born again in 1974, I still have to face the facts of life. Biologically, I'm what you call a 65-year-old teenager. Amen. Uh, I realize that to someone 10 years old, 20, 30, 40, 50, even 60, I'm an old man. <sighs> Boy, that hurts to say. Let me take another. Is this, can you get something stronger than water? That's hard to take. That's hard to swallow. Okay. <laughs> Only an emergency pastor said, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, the question is, did I dream a, de a dream? And the answer is, did I ever? And I'd like to share that dream with you tonight. My dream deals with the ability to discern the true light of salvation. <clears throat> Here's what happened in this dream that I had. The rapture has occurred, and those who have wasted so much time and energy arguing over whether or not Christians will be raptured before or after the time of tribulation will find out that both were right. Those Christians that were hot for Jesus, that were on fire, that were going out and not being hearers only of his, the word, but doers of the word, that were going out and harvesting souls from the world. Those Christians will have been caught up with Jesus in the clouds. But the lukewarm will discover that the warning that God had issued in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, will have taken place. The lukewarm Christians will find that they have been vomited out of God's mouth. He said, I would that you be hot 
or cold. But you are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. And I will, the word is a little more polite, but what it basically means is vomit. Amen. Lukewarm Christians make God sick. Well, the lukewarm Christian is going to have to decide whether they're going to get hot for God in the fire of tribulation or cold and give their soul over to Satan. It's a decision they're going to have to make during terrible times. And the reason that I'm desiring to share this dream with you all tonight is in the hopes that if anyone is lukewarm, they won't want to stay that way. Because the time for Jesus to come back is soon. We see it in all the prophecies that we see being fulfilled almost every day. And the time for playing around with being lukewarm is at an end. And I pray that during this teaching that spiritual ears will be open to hear th and know the truth. And you decide for yourself where you're at. And if you are lukewarm, I pray that you'll be encouraged to change now while there's still time to do so. Or if you decide not to, perhaps maybe you'll find the strength to endure the times of tribulation and get hot for God then. Now in the early days of the church, being fed to the lions was not a fun thing for the early Christian martyrs. What it was to them was a faith thing. It took a faith that was real to choose lions over rejecting Jesus. Now all of you that take pride in being spiritually lukewarm, hear me well. What you must endure to prove that your faith is real during the time of tribulation will make being fed to the lions look like a breeze. I want to share with you the vividness of the dream that I had. It was in three dimensions, stereo sound, color, technicolor, very lively dream. And I'm going to need your gift of imagination tonight. I'm to blame for my unpreparedness. I brought what I thought with me was a working nightlight, and I go to plug it in, and it's not working. Now, who wants us to be in darkness? Satan. But God wants us to have the light. Each of you that are born again have the light of life inside of you. You have a imagination, a rich imagination. And you're going to have to help me tonight and use it. We're going to get this light to light. Okay? Now, here's the dream. You're part of a family. You may be the mother or the father. And the time of tribulation has gone on now for five years. You have two children. Your little boy is four and a half years old, and your little girl is three years old. And witnessing the faith demonstrated by those Christians whom you've seen being put to death has had a profound effect on you. You and your spouse have come to the conclusion that you desire to publicly declare Jesus as your Lord and Master. Having done so has caused you and your family to be brought before a judge. We're already part, part of the way there because a lot of the judges we have today, justice is a joke. Now this judge offers you the choice of either renouncing your faith in Jesus or being put to death. Not just you, but your children as well. Boldly, you say to this judge, never will we reject Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Very well, says the judge. You leave me no other choice but to turn you over to the term to the uh, tormentors. You, your spouse and children are led away by the tormentors and you're taken to a darkened cell 
It measures four foot by four foot. There's no toilet, no running water. There's no windows. There's only one source of light in this cell. <coughs> and you're told it's this round, lighted, everybody see the light? Round, lighted buzzer. And what you're told is that when you're ready to renounce your faith in Jesus, all you need to do is press this buzzer and loudly renounce your faith in Jesus and curse his name. Until the day you do, you no longer exist. The door is slammed shut. The only light in that room is this little round buzzer. You hear the sound of the key activating the lock on the door. And then as you move toward eternity, hours become days, days become weeks. But you have no real concept anymore of weeks, days, or hours. And at first, the hunger seems bearable. And then the stench in the cell starts to sicken your stomach. And as time passes, you'll hear the voices of your little ones who don't understand what's going on. Your son cries out saying, Mama, I'm so hungry. In tears, your daughter cries, Daddy, I'm scared. As this becomes a daily occurrence, and the voices of your starving children become weaker and weaker, what will you do? Satan will be whispering in your ear, Go to the light, press the buzzer, and curse the name of Jesus. That light is the light of your salvation, not Jesus. How will you respond to Satan's lies? What will you say as the lives of your children and your spouse begin to fade away in front of you? Even now, as your own life is beginning to fade, what will be your reaction? The whole world will be watching, waiting, and listening to you, just as God will be. Will you say, shut up, Satan, you stupid liar. Jesus is the true light of my salvation. He lives within my heart and also in the hearts of my wife and children. I hope and pray that this will be your response that you give. But sadly, there will be those who come to believe Satan's lie. They will run to the lighted butter buzzer. <laughs> and they're going to push on it and scream out vile, horrible profanity against Jesus, the name of Jesus. And they'll renounce their belief in Jesus. And they're gonna they're going to push on that buzzer and push on that buzzer and scream and yell profanity until they have a blister on their thumb from pushing that buzzer. Repeatedly, they're going to scream all day long. They'll get hoarse, and they'll say, We've done as you requested. Please, for God's sake, open this door. The audience on television will laugh hilariously at their antics. The audience watching the program on the Tormentors Network will know the truth. That buzzer is merely a prop. It's only a small light fixture. Having no redemptive power, no one will be coming to open the cell door. Satan got what he wanted. He got them to renounce their belief in Jesus. The only power that lighted buzzer has is to deceive those not fully knowing the true light of salvation. Those not having a real, solid faith will choose to reject 
Jesus, the one and only true light of their salvation. Then they'll come to know, as no one comes to open that door, that they've been deceived. They've chosen to accept a cheap, phony imitation light provided by Satan. Sorrow will grip their heart as they will now understand the truth of the scripture. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. They may never know that they were providing entertainment for a sick television audience. Satan never revealed to them the closed circuit monitoring of their cell, which was going on 24 hours a day. He wanted them to feel alone and totally helpless except for that lighted buzzer on the wall. Now, if this dream sounds too far out to you, like an episode from Twilight Zone, please allow me to point out to you the rash of reality television programming that we see flooding the TV networks. These programs are ways that Satan uses to entice the uh, purient voyeurism of our flesh and also to desensitize us to evil. As evil becomes the norm, our flesh desires to be fed more and new and exciting visions of evil. Now, in the early days of filth in the movies, illicit sex from foul-mouthed spiritual morons was called mature. When people began to protest, that term quickly changed to mature adult. And this meaning if you're one of those people who objects to garbage in the movies, it's simply because you are not a mature adult. So what's wrong, they said. People talk like this and do these kind of things every day. They're showing it on the screen is only showing reality. Is that a word we use a lot today, reality programs? It's only showing reality. But supporting this kind of reality is a good way to earn a one-way ticket to hell. Spiritual reality is this. God is holy. Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, I do have good news to share with you. It's not all bad. Satan will also have to deal with those former lukewarm Christians who decided not just to get hot, but stay hot in their belief. <coughs> Just listen to what goes on in their darkened cell. You will hear praise of thanksgiving coming from grateful hearts which ignore physical hunger. You're going to hear, Lord, we thank you for feeding our spiritually hungry soul with the bread of life. You daily nurture our thirsty spirit with living water. Father, we choose to forgive those who, not knowing you, have done this to us. Listen as the little ones crying out are comforted. When the daughter says, Daddy, I'm scared. When the son says, Mama, I'm so hungry. This is what the parents will say. It's all right, my darling children. Have no fear. You'll just be getting to see Jesus a little before we do. But don't worry. It won't be long until we join you in seeing the wonders and splendors of heaven. Hear what they say as their little ones succumb to death. Thank you, Jesus, that we may give back to you the children you blessed our life with. We thank you that we were able to teach them of you and of your great love. Now listen very quietly as with their dying breath you will hear. Thank you, Jesus, 
for saving my soul. Foolishly, I wasted so much of the time you allowed me in life. I thank you now for this opportunity I've been given to store up treasure in heaven. Please be with and strengthen all who will enter this cell after me. Yes, as I am now relating this dream, you can hear what they say. But do you really think that the television audience will have been allowed to hear? No, not even one word. The monitoring in that cell would be cut off and stay off because they didn't go for Satan's deception. They never went near the lighted buzzer. They had discernment to know the true light of salvation, Amen. and that's Jesus Christ. The reason they turned the monitoring off in that cell is they were so fearful that those cold-hearted mockers would get an opportunity to see faith that is real. You know, the early church grew in large numbers because of the martyrs. People would see people who said, bring on your lions. I'm not rejecting Jesus. And they said, these people have something that's real, and I need that. They have a power that's real, and I want that. They don't have fear. They have faith, and I want faith alive in my life. Now, in this dream, we can see the wisdom of being able to discern the true light of salvation from the lie of Satan. And we can also see the true outcome of God's warning. Whosoever would save his life will lose it. The true body and bride of Christ has been lulled into apathy. And the point of my teaching tonight is wake up! She woke up. Son of a gun. I had no idea. <laughs> you just never know. <laughs> anyway, here's the deal. There is a false body and bride of Christ, and that's the religious body and bride of Christ, the people that are powerless, that don't have the guidance of the Holy Spirit in their life. And what happens is they are, each Sunday, sitting for one hour, or maybe sneaking out early, on their powerless, apathetic behind while pathetic things are happening in the world. The true body and bride of Christ will no longer be in apathy, but there'll be a light in the world. They'll be showing lost souls in the world the true light of salvation. They'll be out not just sitting in church and gaining wisdom, gaining strength, gaining power if they've been wounded, having that wound attended to and taken care of and getting the energy to go back out again. They'll be harvesting in the fields that are ripe and bringing souls into God's kingdom. That's the true body and bride of Christ. And those are the people that when Jesus returns will be called up to meet him in the clouds. Now I'd like to share just one other brief teaching that I recently received from the Holy Spirit and it, it's so unique. My wife had a friend up north, well she has a friend, she's still a friend, but she has this friend up north, nice Christian lady, who asked my wife recently an interesting question. She said, if to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, why then, when the day Jesus returns, will the dead in Christ arise to go and meet him? It's an intriguing question. I'd never thought of it before. So my wife told her friend, I don't know, but I'll ask my husband. He seems to have a good two-way communication with the Holy Spirit, and we'll see if he gets an answer. So Dodie asked me, and I'm thinking, boy, Dodie, that's really far out. I never thought of that before. I wonder what it is. 
So I asked the Holy Spirit, okay, Holy Spirit, why is that? Okay, here's why. Our body is temporary. It's made of the dust of the earth, and unto dust we shall return. There's only two things within our body that are eternal, our soul and our spirit. That's if we're a Christian. Now, when you're a Christian, first of all, your soul, what is it made of? In the second chapter of Genesis, you find out your soul was created by <laughs> the breath of God. He breathed a living soul into our body. That's what sets us apart from the angels. The angels were created by the spoken word of God. We're created to be God's children and to become his spiritually mature sons and daughters, to have relationship with him and know him as our father. That's why when they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, our father. That's why scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God and we're encouraged to call him daddy and to boldly approach him in his throne room and make our petitions and our needs known to him. Not afraid, like someone who only knows him as the man upstairs, but as someone who knows him as daddy. Well, when you're a Christian and you die, your soul, which is the breath of God, goes to heaven to be with the Father. It's his breath. But your spirit remains inside this rotting body. But on the day that Jesus returns, Scripture tells us we'll be given a new body, a spiritual body. The body we have now equips us for life here on earth, but it doesn't equip us for heaven. It says in the instant, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be just like Jesus. Jesus has a spiritual body. We'll be given a spiritual body as well, and dwelling within that spiritual body, rising up to meet Jesus in the clouds, will be our soul, which is our free will. God has a free will too, only his free will is holy. That's why he's the Holy Spirit. But in making us in his image, he gave us a free will. He could have had the love of robots, but what good is that? God wanted us to love him in a relationship, a loving relationship, simply because we could see how great his love is for us. And just.